Welcome to our 69th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. Hey, and this is Russell. <laughs> 69. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like we said, uh, people were worried about the five months off and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, we had to have time. Yeah, yeah. They're like, well, Pers- Appreciate everybody's patience big time. I mean, that means a lot that everybody stuck with us. and No doubt. You know, it's not that we were taking a break or we had to. No, Russ is literally working crazy. But today we are talking about the Swedish King Tiger. And me and Russ have read and got most of our research from tankexcyclopedia.com. So we're giving them a big shout out. Um, it's a great site for accurate information, and we strongly suggest that you go check it out. Um, it's got about every tank that you'd ever want, and uh, it even covers a little bit of uh, uh, just about everything. Um, I, I was researching some uh, new modern Italian tanks, and uh, they even had it there. But we had a, a couple of listeners suggest that we jump straight into our episodes and save the chit chat uh, for after we finish the episode, because some people just want the information and they don't want to hear about what we're doing. Or I what's know. Going. Yep. We are kind of boring guys. Our lives are pretty boring. I agree. We play Dungeons and Dragons or we play World of Tanks. <laughs> That's kind of it. That's it. Yeah. So let's give it a shot, Russ. Uh, let's start off today with the information on the swedish tiger king tiger i apologize not many tanks in history have achieved the legendary status of the panzer kampfwagen tiger ossif b or the konig steiger despite all the research on this tank not many know that after the war several nations among them sweden acquired examples to evaluate and test during world war ii sweden had declared neutrality but was sandwiched between the invading Germans in Norway and the Soviet offensive in Finland, the latter probably being of more concern to Swedish authorities. Sweden aided both the Axis and the Allied powers during the conflict. Germany was allowed to transport the whole 163rd Infantry Division, along with all its equipment and supplies, from Norway to Finland across Sweden to fight the Soviets in June and July of 1941. And iron reserves continued to be sold all the way up to 1944. On the other hand, military intelligence was passed on to the Allies, and Danish and Norwegian clandestine resistance groups were trained on Swedish soil. From 1944 onward, Swedish air bases were open to Allied aircraft. In spite of its neutrality, Sweden was always afraid of a potential invasion and as a result, had developed a number of indigenous tanks in the period leading up to the war and during the war itself. Along with this, Sweden possessed a powerful navy, which could have discouraged an invasion. When we say the Allies and the Axis were, you know, or Sweden was working with both, you got to put yourself in their shoes. You know, I'm not saying, oh my gosh, they helped the Axis. Oh, what terrible. I think they were trying to reduce the actual damage done to their country. They didn't want their soldiers to die. They didn't want their people to die. You know, they saw what was going on. You know, they didn't particularly like, you know, the Nazis. And like you said, they were training people in their country and the allies and, you know, passing information as best they could. But if I was president of Sweden, I, I don't know if, I would do everything I could not to get my people killed. Yeah, I agree. After the end of the war, sometime between 1946 and 1947, Swedish military authorities sent personnel across Europe to acquire intact or semi-intact German tanks for the purpose of testing. One of the main aims of these tests was to see how anti-tank mines and other weaponry in the Swedish arsenal fared against heavily armored tanks. The first tank that they acquired was a single Panzer V Panther at a tank depot outside of Versailles with a Koenigsteiger as their next objective. Finding one of these famed tanks proved to be harder than anticipated, 
until August of 1947, when one was found in Guyen, south of Paris. They didn't have a problem finding the Panthers. They were all along the sides of the road. <laughs> they were everywhere, yeah. <laughs> and again, we are not dogging the Panther. No, no. We got Panther fans out there that will say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> relax, relax. We're just saying that, you know, France had a bunch on the sides of roads. But the King Tigers, um, they were a little bit harder to find. Another burnout possible test example having belonged to the 503rd Heavy Panzer Battalion, was found near the town of Vimontere in Normandy and was rejected in October 1946 as it did not meet the requirements of the Swedish authorities. Both the Panther and the Gien Konigsteiger were handed to the Swedish by the French authorities free of charge. All right. that You know, everybody was like, wow, that's really nice of them. They're like, no, it's like having a bunch of beer cans laying all over your yard. You're like, you want my beer cans? Here, take these. Take this off my hands, yep. But, you know, we say beer cans and stuff like that. We're, we're just kidding, of course. But there were free German tanks uh, from the French. And guess why? Because most of them were broke down on the side of the road and sabotaged by the crews, which I'm sure the poor Sherman drivers driving down the road were glad they weren't active in shooting at them. The King Tiger's gun was actually really good and <laughs> really good at far ranges. But think about it, Russ. Could you imagine a Sherman tank guy and he's driving down, seeing all these sabotaged or burnout Panthers yeah. and going, man, I'm glad I didn't have to shoot at exactly, that Exactly, yep. Because, you know, if they were manned and in, you know, working condition, coming down the road, that first Sherman is just smoked. Scandinavisk Express was commissioned to provide transport for the tank to Stockholm as soon as possible. However, it would not be until November 27, 1947, that the Konigsteiger would be unloaded at Stockholm docks. The Konigsteiger was transferred to the Skaraborgs Regiment in Skovdi, approximately 265 kilometers west of Stockholm. After some time in which the tank was left in poor condition outside a workshop, that sounds familiar, mm -hmm. work finally began to put the tank in running order during which a German grenade was found within its hole. Yeah. Now, I want to cut in right here. What me and Russ were talking about is, you know, they, they've got this iconic King Tiger and it's been setting Outside, in the rain, snow, everything else, and, and, you know, just in poor condition. And then they finally go, you know what? We, we need this. Let's work on it. And, and talking of which, uh, Rob just cleaned up the, our, our, the tiger we once oh, saw. I know. I'm telling you, we got to get back down there. We will once they get it all set up. That's what I've kind of been waiting on. And, yep, I'm, I'm ready for another trip down there. I think it'll be well worth the wait. If you guys are new to the show and don't know what we're talking about, uh, Russ and I had the extreme honor and pleasure of meeting Rob Cohen and uh, down at Fort Benning in Georgia. Fort Benning, Georgia, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we've known him for a couple of years now. And when he started out, the Tiger didn't have um, its tracks on. It was laying in parts. Um, but uh, they... They got it all together and got it cleaned up and took it over to that new, uh, they can't call it a museum, but a display they're area. They're calling it the Tankadrome, I think, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the Tankadrome. Uh, yeah, it's uh, going to be awesome once I get it uh, What is that, completed. the Armored Infantry? I'll have to look it up. I don't know the exact name, but let me find we'll that real you quick. You know what? You know what? We'll, don't worry about it. We'll just put a link on our Facebook later. Yeah, yeah. And that way everybody can just oh, yeah. click it and go straight there yeah. and see the before and after pictures of the yeah. tiger. It's incredible. And, and even our king tiger, you know, the Americans do have a king tiger, and it's yep. looking really good now. It really is, yeah. It would seem that the German crew or personnel in charge of the vehicle had in mind to destroy it rather than allow it to fall into Allied hands when they abandoned their tank. Once the engine was reassembled, a short test run around the workshop grounds proved the vehicle was still capable of moving. 
The vehicle was further tested in Skovdi, being subjected to several terrain driving tests. In one of the tests, the swing arm of one of the end wheels broke. It was soon welded back together, but the testing team had to be more careful in subsequent tests. After its restoration, the L-71 KWK-43 8.8 centimeter gun was tested, provided that suitable ammunition could be found. The gun remained attached until early 1949. Okay, here's a fun fact. If you see an enemy vehicle on the side of the road, uh, go ahead and treat it like it's rigged to blow. Um, and have your uh, IED guys clear it. Um, could you imagine, you know, like you we, you were telling us, that when they you know were working on it and getting it ready to, they found a grenade ready to blow that they had set. Can you imagine the kid that was, you know, cleaning the inside out or, or f- help fixing it, finds this grenade and walks into the boss's office and says, hey, what's this? I'm sure he probably crapped his drawers in the process, too. <laughs> yeah. I, I just keep, uh, I can't tell you what police department, but it, when I was working in uh, Jackson County, Missouri, there was a police department where they got a phone call. And one of the guys that I had been his field training officer, he had went to this large department, let's just say that, in uh, the Jackson County area. And uh, he uh, drove out, and there was a woman that wanted to uh, show her, uh, pol- uh, show a police officer uh, something that her son had been doing. And she said, listen, you know, my son's been reading these anarchist cookbooks and stuff like that. And he's been making these, you know, dumb bombs. Can you take it and get it out of here? It's, you know, I'm afraid it's going to go off. So he looks at it and he says, well, is this supposed to be a bomb? And she goes, I don't know. I just want you to take the books and this stuff and get it out of my house. So he loads up the books and, you know, whatever, you know, the, thing was and puts it in the back of the trunk and he drives it to the police department and pulls into their sally port and he casually walks in and he grabs one of the bomb guys and he goes hey can you come out here and take a look at this and so he pops the trunk and the guy goes holy crap it's live he drove a bomb all the oh, way to the police department no. in the back of his truck or oh. trunk right right above the gas tank and it was fully loaded. It was one of those, um, ammonium nitrate bombs. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He oh, goes, man. man, they had the guys in there at the bomb squad. They had to call the bomb squad from Kansas city. I don't know how he kept his job, but he did. In late 1948, it was decided to move the tank to Carlsborg testing area, roughly 60 kilometers to the east. There, the Konigsteiger would fulfill its intended role as a guinea pig for gun tests. This operation proved to be of a gargantuan scale and full of complications. The transport had originally been planned for between September 24th and 29th of 1948, but the swing arm incident postponed the transport indefinitely. Due to the weight of the vehicle, the easy option to transport it by train directly to Carlsborg and then tow it to the facilities was not plausible as the line crossed a canal bridge, which would not support the extra weight of the tank. Don't build tanks or don't send tanks over that can't get over the bridges. Exactly. Yeah. 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 If it's that heavy, man, that's wow. In the end, the tank was transported by train to Finnerosia and then transported by a convoy to its final destination in Carlsborg, 60 kilometers away. The convoy needed to transport it was made up of a turretless M4A4 Sherman, the tractor unit of an M26 Dragon Wagon, an M-46 Swedish Brockway, which is a 10-ton recovery vehicle, a fuel truck, two cars for personnel, and four motorbikes. The roads not having been built to take this kind of weight and the abundance of forest meant that the journey took between November 10th and 15th and cost a staggering 10,000 Swedish krona and a total consumption of 6,000 liters of gasoline. Once in Carlsberg, testing could resume. Okay, in American dollars, 
in, in gallons, uh, that's 1,585 gallons of gas and $4,755 of today's money just to move 60 kilometers. That's just totally incredible, to be honest with you. I mean, that's that's a hunk of metal now. So they're pulling this thing all the way over there, and guess what they're going to do? Well, well, Russ, you go ahead. Throughout 1949 and up until 1951, the vehicle was subject to mine detonations and barrage tests to gauge the strength of the Koenigsteiger's armor and the effectiveness of Swedish ammunition. And as far as can be confirmed, there were seven different tests. Test number one occurred December 1st to December 2nd, 1948. The Koenigsteiger and the Sherman armor were fired upon by a variety of weapons and calibers, among which were a 8 centimeter M-49 bazooka, an M-48 Carl Gustav recoilless rifle, a 10.5 centimeter Ponsarskot M-45, and an M-46 disposable recoilless rifle, a 10.5 centimeter Infanterra cannon M-45, and a 7.5 centimeter Pavakin M-43 on board a PV. VK M-43. The Koenigsteiger was fired upon 17 times, and it was found that the majority of the weapons could not penetrate it frontally, with the exception of the disposable recoilless rifles, which could disable the tank with just one or two hits. However, when fired upon from the side, the damage was noteworthy. After this fire test, the engine and gearbox were removed. So they're blowing holes in the fronts and the side, and they're like, maybe we should go ahead and take the engine out, you know, the gearbox. Uh, You know what? Maybe take the gas tank out. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Russ. In test number two that occurred between November 7th and 21st of 1949, the vehicle was shot at 26 times to test different 8-centimeter and 12-centimeter heat ammunition and 10.5-centimeter wall burster Hesh rounds. The latter rounds were discarded for future tests due to their limited success, despite creating some splits in the hole. So they're testing out their new Hesh and heat rounds, and all it did was do some splitting. <laughs> okay, well, uh, back to the drawing board exactly. for rounds. Yep. Test number three occurred between January 25th and 27th of 1950. This test studied the effects of subcaliber projectiles on heavy armor and were overall disappointing with several projectiles breaking on impact. This was attributed to the use of substandard materials in their construction and production method. Test number four occurred between March 1st and 2nd of 1950. Artillery pieces firing HE, two 10.5 centimeter and one 15 centimeter were tested against the front of the vehicle and the side in front of the turret. Heat mines were also tested. The 15 centimeter rounds caused considerable but not serious damage to the welds, though this was put down to faulty construction, not to the merits of the gun firing. Some sources suggest that after this test, the main gun was removed. They removed the gun. I I can just imagine those guys sitting there bouncing rounds off, and they're like, you know what? We could probably use that gun for something to test our armor. Go ahead and take that off. We were talking about the different numbers of the test. Uh, test number five, uh, no details are known. Uh, but I, I'm sure they were shooting at it again. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah, test number five, um, we couldn't find anything. I, I researched for, what, two days uh, trying to find anything about this uh, number five test. And, uh, couldn't find anything, but we can imagine they were shooting and, you know, throwing stuff at it. Test number six, though, uh, occurred on December 12th of 1950. This test was carried out to assess the damage different shells, grenades, and launched projectiles had on a vehicle's mobility from which the testing crew could calculate the average repair time. They found that of the weapons, at the very least, a 57 millimeter HE round from a 57 millimeter Pavakin M-43 was useful for stopping a vehicle such as the Koenigsteiger as long as the detonation happened near the tracks or at the front. 
you know what? In in that research, Russ and I could not find how close they were firing that round. But they're like, oh yeah, fifty seven will stop it you know, as long as you hit it in the tracks, you know, or at the front. Yeah, you know where the tracks are. But yeah, how close were you? I don't know exactly. Yeah, because that would make a huge me, difference. Yeah, yeah. Believe me, if a tiger sees you from a certain distance, uh, especially a king tiger, yeah, that fifty seven's you know gone. <laughs> One shot. Test number seven occurred between May tenth and eleventh. On, in 1951, uh, again for this test, a Sherman was used alongside the Koenigsteiger to test different ammunition of the 7.5 centimeter Ivkin M-37 anti-aircraft gun and the 15.2 centimeter Phalapjus M-37 coastal artillery cannon. Okay, that would probably do some big damage, but go ahead. Yeah, we've talked about coastal artillery cannons before, I think, in previous episode or two. And by the end of the testing, this intense firepower turned the whole of the vehicle into a small pile of scrap, and what was left was actually scrapped. The turret was sent to the firing range in Croc to be used as target practice, becoming a popular target for the crews of the newly arrived STRV-81 or the Centurion Mark III. It was common to use training rounds for the 20-pounder, 84-millimeter gun, armed STRV-81, which penetrated the turret all the time. The gun was kept for some time in Carlsborg until it was sent to the Bofors HQ in Karlskoga, where it remained until eventually being scrapped in the late 1980s. Unfortunately, two weeks later, a member of the Swedish Armor Historical Society arrived inquiring about the gun. Had they arrived a fortnight earlier, the QWK-43 would, would quite likely be found today at Arsenalen. The only pieces remaining are the original engine, the gearbox, and the rear hatch, which was found lying about a crock firing range in the 1970s. So, they, they found the gearbox... And they found the engine that they took out. And then, of course, the rear hatch. They're like, oh, go ahead and take that rear hatch and, you know, just throw it over there. Just sitting there. The engine and gearbox can now be found at the Swedish Tank Museum, though they have an exciting yet mysterious and confused story themselves. Allegedly, after having been removed and stored at the Garrison Museum, Skarborg, in the tiny town of Axval, under dodgy circumstances and poor communication, the engine and gearbox were lent to Kevin Wheatcroft, a collector in the UK. When the return package from the UK arrived, a shell and a scrap engine were found inside. Eventually, the original engine and gearbox were found by British police in 2010 in the workshop of Mr. Wheatcroft, who denies any wrongdoing and has collaborated Contrary to what some internet sources have claimed, Mr. Wheatcroft has at no point been trialed or convicted of any crime. The intermediary between the museum and the collector, Daniel Mysick, was convicted of fraud and embezzlement. So what we're saying is just the truth. We have nothing against the Mr. Wheatcroft. And for legal reasons, please read the Wheatcroft Tiger Tank Legal Statement, and we will provide a link to that statement. It is unusual to have an origin story after the fate section. Uh, for decades, there was a debate over which German unit the Swedish Koenigsteiger had previously belonged to, or what exact model it was, and there was no general census in the history. It would not be until the excellent work of Herbert Ackermann's and per Sonnervik, that the mystery would finally be solved. Finding that the Swedish Koenigsteiger was a test vehicle marked 211 from Kummersdorf, which was the 6 Series produced King Tiger tank with chassis number 280-006. This Swedish Koenigsteiger had three main characteristics. It had a pre-production turret. The first 50 vehicles were produced with the pre-production turret the incorrectly termed Porsche turret, while the subsequent tanks were equipped with the production turret, again often incorrectly referred to as the Hinchel turret. 
The gun was a single piece barrel tube. The first version of the 8.8 centimeter KWK 43 consisted of an integral one piece barrel tube with a larger muzzle brake. And that was taken from the Tiger one in May, 1944 it was replaced by a two piece barrel tube, which was easier to produce in quantity without deteriorating firing capabilities. According to production statistics, 11 tanks were produced before the barrel was changed. And during the month when the barrel tubes were changed, 19 tanks were manufactured. So it's possible that some of these also had the single piece barrel. So between 11 and 30 King Tigers had the earlier barrel. The turret had two eyed sights. The Swedish Koenigsegger had the early two eyed 9B slash 1 sight. This type of sight was changed in May 1944 to a newer model, the 9D sight, which used only one opening in the frontal turret armor. This allows the identification of the Swedish Koenigsteiger as one of the first 50 tanks with the pre-production turret. With a one-piece gun barrel, the number of potential tank individuals is further reduced and production time can be set to May of 1944 at the very latest. Additionally, the Swedish Koenigsteiger had 11 details, which make it such a fascinating example. The first detail was that it had two flame suppressors with a bend in them. One of the most striking features at first glance on this tank are the horizontally placed flame suppressors, as these on the Panther were placed vertically. Uh, the second detail consisted of the KGS 73 slash 800 slash 152 track links and the fourth version drive sprockets, which consisted of the SPZ ABT 506 unit had tested these new track links in the winter of 1944 to 45 before they were standardized in March of 1945. It is also likely that pre-production turret tanks in Germany could have been modified in a similar way. The drive sprocket is of the version 4 variant, which was not introduced until March of 1945, meaning that it was replaced from the original version 1 at some point. The third detail was that the armor protection over the snorkel, this was only seen in the first 11 vehicles before February 1944. The fourth detail consisted of rain drainage at the loader's hatch, a common feature in the first series vehicles. The fifth detail was the Zimmerit on both turret and chassis. Okay, the sixth detail consisted of the pistol ports on both sides of the turret that was welded shut, but not the port for discarding empty shells. The seventh detail consisted of no turret ring protection. And the eighth detail consisted of no opening for the preheating of the engine cooling system. This featured in tanks built after February 1944 so it cannot be found in the first 11 vehicles. The ninth detail consisted of no fittings to lock the front flat track guards. Uh, the prototypes V1, V2, and V3 featured this, so this is firm evidence that the Swedish Koenigsteiger was not one of the three prototypes. The tenth detail, uh, no center mount on the rearmost side mud guard. The prototypes in some early production vehicles lack this feature. And the 11th detail that had no recess in the front armor on the right-hand side at the machine gunner's periscope. There's evidence that this featured on vehicle number 280-009, so the Swedish Koenigsteiger predates this. A combination of all these details means a few long-held theories on the, the origin of this vehicle can be discarded. The engine cooling system, combination of factors, uh, set this King Tiger as an early type, uh, pre-production turret, uh, single piece barrel, two-eyed sights, et cetera, et cetera, with some late modifications, you know, like the sprocket and, and the late war uh, track links. This means that the vehicle was an early vehicle kept in Germany throughout the war for tests and modifications which explain the late war features as a result. It is safe to conclude that the Swedish uh, King Tiger was a test tank marked with the number 211 from Kummersdorf, which was the 6 Series production tank with the chassis number 280006. The vehicle was sent to the winter testing facility in uh, Austria 
at some point, probably late 1944, after the end of the war in Europe, the vehicle was transported to a gathering place in Guine, uh, France. This is a uh, CIOS report from the winter test site that shows that a King Tiger, at least a King Tiger with the pre-production turret and a Panther, both in the mountain area, which makes it, you know, more likely that it's the same King Tiger. Unfortunately, the Swedish King Tiger is a product of a bygone era when the heritage of armored vehicles was hardly at, at the forefront of anyone's agenda. Despite its peculiarities, the vehicle did not stand out among the scores of destroyed and abandoned vehicles and debris which occupied most of Europe in 1945. The vehicle served its purpose, first as a German fighting vehicle, and secondly as a target for Sweden to test its weapons. The way to look at this is the Swedish uh, government and army had brought this King Tiger and this Panther over to do actual tests. They weren't thinking about putting in a museum or anything. They were trying to find out what their equipment could do. So they killed an awesome example of a King Tiger. But I know everyone's going to ask, you know, what happened to the Panther tank, Russ? Well, there's actually a video showing in 1946 the Swedish Army comparing the Panther against a Sherman Firefly, as well as a Churchill and their ability to pass through rough terrain. The Panther was used mostly for terrain tests and firing at targets with its gun against new types of armor till the 1960s. It was given back to Germany in the 1980s, restored, and is currently in running order at the Deutsche Panzer Museum. That's awesome. When I was doing some research on the Panther tank or the Swedish Panther tank in that video, uh, the first video uh, shows the Panther and the Sherman Firefly and the Churchill doing terrain tests and stuff like that. The other videos, the Churchill's not there anymore. So I, th- I think they had some problems with this Churchill being able to do anything, and they were like, yeah, you know what, let's just do it against the, uh, f- you know, the Sherman Firefly. But what really kicks, kicks me uh, is you can find these videos on YouTube. The, they're on there. They use the Panther for terrain tests, and then they were testing their tanks, their new tanks, with having the Panther shoot at them. So it was in pretty good shape. And, and the fact that, you know, they didn't shoot it all up and they actually kept it around and returned it. And, the you know, they restored it. And now we can go over to Germany um, and actually see this thing driving around. Yeah, that's definitely a museum we need to put on our list eventually. And um, In fact, uh, Brittany just was over in Europe, wasn't she? What country? Sweden, wasn't it? Or Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah, she was in Switzerland. Yeah, she went. I said, hey, you got to do something with the military stuff. You know, you got to go look at it. So she went to an old castle. And I'm like, that's not, uh, well, I guess that is military. Um, Dang it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Well, it'd be great for my D&D campaign. There you go. She got got some great uh, pictures of the castle. And even how they went to that bathroom in there, it was gross. Let me just tell you that. Yeah, I can imagine. You ever heard of a thing called the cha- chamber pot? I've heard of them, yeah. Ugh. How'd you like to be that guy's job? That's quite all right. We've kind of finished the episode, except we want to talk about uh, tanks in the news today, or what What are we calling the sec- section again? Yeah, tanks in the news. Let's talk about, oh, I know, Poland. Yeah. It's, Poland's kind of on the radar. This particular article comes from the Notes from Poland website. Some of the latest news in in Poland. In July 14th, 2021, they wrote an article on this particular website that was titled uh, Poland to buy 250 U.S. Abrams tanks as a deterrent against Russia. Pretty much, uh, Poland has announced the purchase of 250 of the latest M1A2 Abrams tanks from the United States with delivery expected sometime next year. Um, the new equipment will replace the Polish Army's Soviet-era tanks and help to create a greater deterrent against Russia. Uh, 
funds for the purchase had already been approved by the government. The value of the contract, including logistics and training, is estimated at, a, at almost 23.5 billion zloty, or 6 billion U.S. dollars, which is equivalent to the Defense Ministry's annual spending on all weapon systems in recent years. They must have had a real threat. Uh, yeah, they've got something going on that they're... So, somebody knew something, and they told their big guys, and they're like, yeah, let's let, let's get some tanks in here. And speaking at the 1st Warsaw Armored Brigade today, the chairman of the ruling Law and Justice Party and deputy prime minister responsible for security said that the new tanks were the most modern in the world. And pretty much it's the latest version of the M1A2 Abrams tank, which is the SEP V3, and it's been in service since about 2020. Uh, and i got to admit, uh, I've done some, how do I say this? I've talked to my soon-to-be uh, nephew-in-law, who's a driver of one of these tanks, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, it's an awesome tank. Oh, I could just imagine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I've sent you some yeah, private video yeah, and stuff. Yeah, it's just incredible. Let, let's just say we can't talk a lot about this tank. <laughs> Probably still some secrets inside. Against the T90? <laughs> I, I, I don't think there's too many problems. And pretty much Poland, um, they're just wanting to upgrade um, what they had before. And all they had before was a few Soviet-era T72 tanks as well as the later. Junk. The what? Is there junk? Yeah, pretty much. And they also had a few of the later PT ninety one models. Um, now, see the PT ninety one. I didn't. I don't. I don't have a problem with the Abrams tanks that the that Poland is actually buying. Will be equipped with the new generation armor, uh, the remotely controlled firing systems, as well as the options of using programmable ammunition. Uh, they'll also be integrated to work with the F thirty five aircraft. Pro programmable uh, ammunition well, that's new to me yeah you, you know you're I'll doing your to, ammunition uh, look into ammunition that episode yeah, yeah. oh i'm so, telling you i'm gonna I probably have to break that episode up into like world war ii era uh, ammunition and yeah and then the more today but yeah if you guys don't know what programmable ammunition is welcome to the club we, <laughs> yeah. we've got to research that too this is something new and what people say is like, what do you mean it's integrated to work with the F-35 aircraft? <laughs> that means that the aircraft is talking to the tank and they are working together. Yep, they work in tandem. To so let's say the F-35 races over an area where the tank is at Mach, you know, 5 or whatever. And it automatically sends all the information, even flying at mock speeds to the tank and say, oh, you might want to know that we picked up heat signatures from this area, this quadrant, and it looks like uh, four guys with a bazooka behind a couple of trees. So with the programmable ammunition, it'll pull out like a, a high explosive and fire automatically at, at those you know heat signatures, wiping them out. I, I'm telling you, there's a lot more about this oh, Abrams than man, every, yeah. everybody, everybody thinks. It's top of the line, I'm telling you. It really is like the next stage. It is. And we're wanting to, re we're wanting to replace them with something else. I know. But we'll talk about that someday. Yeah. I know Poland's defense uh, minister stressed that the purchase was motivated by challenges to international security and that these tanks were meant as a deterrent. You know, we hear so many deterrent talks, like nuclear, biological. Uh, Poland's are just like, we're going to get these Abrams, and uh, I don't think it'd be a good idea to charge 250 of them. A uh, defense minister was like, uh, we all know this aggressor is and what threats are possible. So it is a quick and decisive response to these threats. They are battle-tested tanks that have been designed as a counterweight to uh, the most modern Russian, uh, like T-14 uh, Marte, what, Ar Armada, Marty? yeah. Armada tanks. I apologize. We did an episode we on did, that. We did, yes. So if you haven't uh, heard about our T-14, 
Yeah, uh, we act. I actually fell in love with that. Uh, I know tank. it's an impressive tank, but against the upgraded and new uh, uh, Abrams, I I'll, I'll still go with the Abrams. <laughs> Not because I'm an American and say, "Oh, we got the best." I'm just saying, mm, if I can coordinate with a jet, you know, exactly. Yeah, let's do that. Last month, in a closed session of Parliament. Uh, the Polish government reportedly warned MPs that Russia had plans to invade Poland. Uh, the new tanks will be stationed in eastern Poland as part of the 18th Mechanized Division. The large outlay on the new equipment has raised questions about feasibility and logistics. It is a good tank, but its maintenance can be a serious problem, in particular due to high fuel consumption. They also noted that the weight of the tanks could make them almost impossible to operate in some parts of Poland as it exceeds the load capacity of most of their bridges. There's downsides and plus sides to that. Yeah, you know, if your country is about to be invaded and you're like, oh, my tanks can't get across the bridges and stuff like that. Well, that means the enemy tanks exactly. can't get across your bridges. Yeah. But th they're going to put this on the eastern border, and, and again, we have nothing against uh, the people of Russia. Um, uh, we've repeatedly uh, told people, if you know uh, Vladimir Putin, tell him to send us one of those yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, black yeah, black uh, tanks, the, you know, the new tanks, because we'll just give it to the Bovington yeah, Museum. Yeah, sure, after we give it a test. Uh, yeah, they got, they got to look. If we get, if we get Bovington a, a, an Abrams or a tank, they got to let us at oh, least drive it once. So we've talked about tanks in the news and, and stuff like that, and there's a lot of stuff going on right now. You know, Russia and China are getting to be a lot better. I don't know allies. Yeah, and um, at no point as American citizens do we wish. Uh, any war or anything like that. But people are like, oh, you know, if Russia and China teamed up, uh, you know, they'd rule the world. Well, if you look at NATO, let's say, first off, people say Ukraine. Ukraine is part of NATO, but not our military. It's more of the financial stuff, you know, trades and oil and, you know, everything else, you know, food, but they're not a military thing. So, you know, with Ukraine and, and Russia having their problems, I, I don't know that we would get involved or NATO would get involved on a military thing, but if they invaded Poland, they better take a, you know, a, a note from history. You know, you know, when Ger Germany was fine taking, you know, all this other little stuff, but they told them if you go into Poland, of, of course you realize this means war. And everybody says, oh, Russia would roll over NATO. Well, Russia's got uh, 771,000 uh, troops, you know, active troops. NATO's got 3.48 million. And everybody's like, well, where are you getting those numbers? We're talking about everybody in NATO. You know, you're talking about all these other countries that are in NATO um, that are European countries. If they did come, you know, there was a mass declaration, you know, starting another world war. Um, air power. Air power is what's going to, you know, decide everything. NATO's got 3,891 combat-capable aircraft. Russia has 1,200. That, that's a huge difference. And everybody says, well, you know, the uh, NATO countries haven't practiced, you know, working together. And I'm like, no, you're, you're wrong because they've been doing these uh, joint training exercises called SWIFT Response. I know 2020 they had a big SWIFT uh, response training thing, but they've done it before. They, they've trained for this, you know, they know who's going where and what's going to do, you know, on the grand scale, you invade Poland. I think everybody in NATO is just going to naturally just sign on. 
I, I don't think any country is just going to sit by and watch Poland fall. You're looking at all those aircraft now coordinated, 3,800, you know, almost 3,900 NATO aircraft at combat capable against 1,200. We're going to get air superiority pretty quick. And then they go, well, you know, the Russians have the T-90s and the T-14s and stuff like that. Okay, they have 2,600 main battle tanks. NATO with the Leopards and Challengers and Abrams and everything else, they have almost 9,500 main battle tanks. And you're talking about uh, like aircraft carriers. Russia has one. NATO has 13, you know. Uh, and, and then you talk about like uh, your armored infantry fighting vehicles, you know, just just a mix of everything you're talking about. Russia has, you know, 5,000 NATO's got 10,000, almost 11,000. It's 10,815. Wow. If they did attack Poland, I'm pretty sure that would start a, another world war. Uh, and I hate everybody saying, Oh, you're just Americans. And, and you think, you know, America do amazing against Russia, but it's not the Americans against Russia. No. It would be NATO against Russia. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's all the countries. I, I even think Italy and uh, France and, and Germany, because they know what's up. If you, today's a different climate. And if you move in your tanks and, and your army into a sovereign country, that's part of NATO it, it's going to be bad. I agree. You know, you move into Poland, the world's going to declare yeah, war against you. Yeah. And they're like, well, the Chinese would be sending aircraft and stuff like that. I, I don't know because it, right now they're having trouble with uh, India. And if the world, NATO and everything like that, I don't know if India would sit there and just take it. China would really have to start building up forces uh, against India. And, uh, you know, people are going to say, you're silly when I bring this up. Vietnam. Vietnam and China, you know, haven't got along in their entire history. Now they're like big trading partners now. I think Vietnam is like China's or China's main trading partner now or China's Vietnam's main trading partner. But that's also with Australia. So if China jumps in the war against, you know, or, you know, to help in this invasion of Poland and starts providing troops and stuff, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Vietnam, India, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, the Philippines, and, and the Americans, when you're pressuring from South Korea, in North Korea that goes straight into the Chinese thing. And then the t stuff with Taiwan, I, I don't know. I think China would be having to watch its own back. You know, I don't know if they could send a lot. I mean, sure. They can send, you know, troops and stuff like that, but send them all the way across from, you know, the far East to Europe without the support and stuff like that. And it really wouldn't matter once air support was, you know, air dominance got in involved. I think China has a lot more on their plates. I kind of agree with you on that. If they were just to jump headstrong into helping the Soviet Union invade Poland, I mean, yeah, I they've they've got to watch things on their on their backside too. I don't know. I I, I hope everybody has cool heads and we can just work this out diplomatically. And at no point are we saying that the Chinese aren't a powerful country and we're not saying Russia is. I'm just saying against the whole world, probably not a good idea. Probably not a good idea. And I'm with you. You know, NATO will jump right in because they, if Russia invades Poland, I mean, that's, that's a huge threat on the rest of Europe. I mean, that's just, that's a given. I mean... Germany's got a, yeah. a again, got a, a, a really good military. They're not going to put up no, with it. No, no. And, and, well, I mean, the entire, you're talking about everybody. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even think, you know, Portugal or uh, Spain or 
anybody yeah. is going to set with that. I think that, that would be just one mass condemning and military support. I agree. You're talking about the United States sending food, supplies, and everything straight across the Atlantic with almost zero worry about being attacked. They're like, well, there's Soviet and Chinese subs. Yeah, but we've got some really good satellite information. I, you know, I know everybody's laughing and, you know, the United States, a paper tiger now and stuff, but we, we really do have these satellites in the space and we, and yeah. So hopefully yeah, there's so much positive about Russia and, and we're not trying to say anything negative about Russia. It, it's just like, they are actually taking our astronauts up to the space station. Yeah. You know, we hitch rides with them, yeah. you know, and, and there's so much we can do together, but. I'm just hoping everybody takes a step back. I know. They always say history repeats itself, though, unfortunately. I hope not. I don't even think it'd be a nuclear no, showdown. No. Yeah, I, I, I don't even think it'd be a nuclear. I, I think it, with the forces that we have in the area and stuff like that, uh, we would definitely push them back. I, I don't know if we would go into Russia. I think it'd be kind of like the Iraqi-Kuwaiti deal. Uh, that we could push them back. Um, I mean, we would definitely damage some stuff in the interior, you know, supply lines and, you know, vehicles in route and troops in route. And, and the Chinese, you know, with, you know, Japan and, you know, everybody else looking at them on their south. I, I don't know if that's a good idea because, you know, if India said, you know, if China jumped in and said we are, you know, allies with the, Russia, and we're going to start moving troops up there. I'm afraid India would jump into that. And if India jumps, India and Vietnam has been friends for years. Uh, in fact, the Indian government has supported, uh, like, like the emperor of when Vietnam had emperors. I, I think that'd be a big mess down there. Because if, if we've learned anything, you can't push the Vietnamese oh, around. Oh, I know. Exactly. On their uh, turf, I, yep. You know, everybody says, why do you want to go to, you know, uh, Hanoi in Vietnam and stuff? Well, first, I think I'd like to go around and apologize to some Vietnamese people. <laughs> Say, you know, it wasn't the American people. It was our government. And we apologize for that. And then I want to go check out their war museum. What do we have left for us? We got shout, shout outs? outs. Well, uh, who do we got to shout out to? I, mainly, I want to shout out to uh, 10 year old Zach. He's actually left us a message on our speakpipe.com. Um, if you're not sure what that is, then you can go to our website at www.twotankersandcat.com. And there's a link there on the front page to where you can leave us a voice message. Or something you don't like about what we're doing, something we, you do like what we're doing, uh, just leave us a message or just say hello. But that's what that's what Zach did, and really do appreciate it. Well, let's hear what Zach Attack had to say. Okay. Hi, I'm Jane, your cat. I'm a big fan. I'm ten. We've been to tanks in history. Love your podcast. Hope you mention in the next podcast whenever that will be. So, I'm kind of bored. I don't listen to any other podcasts except yours. And, yeah, I just love your podcast. Such a great podcast. Please mention this um, voice thing during your next video. Please, that'll make me really happy. Bye. Okay, that's that's cool. Zach Attack, you are the man now. Now we get to Patreon? Yeah. We'll, or do we have more shout-outs? We'll shout do outs? our Patreon shout-outs. And, and we have to give big thank yous to... Uh, well, who's our first one? Jake Azaki. Oh, and Kim and Eric Shear. We got to give them mad shouts. Thank you so much. Antonio Bernarda and Alejandro Martinez. Still with us. <laughs> Great oh, guys. Oh, I know. Uh, Bjorn Ben, ODS Theron, and of course, Rick Schmidt. Mad oh, love to I him. I know. I'm telling you what, I think he was the first one to ever give us any support yep. monetarily and yep. really do appreciate that rick you've been a, a pillar to the show <laughs> we we actually consider our patreon guys you know part of the you know big time two tankers yep. in account 
uh, because we'll be honest, these new mics oh, and stuff. Oh, I know. You know Hopefully you hear a lot of difference in, in Charlie's voice this go around. We got rid of his Walmart, $25. Walmart microphone. and It was so oh, bad. Oh, wow. But yeah, we upgraded the, the mic at his place, and hopefully it sounds a lot better. I think it will. And like I said, I'll be getting on the road soon and be heading out, and, and that way I can do some traveling you know, shows where I'm saying, Hey, I'm, you know, in Montana, you know, and I'm looking at the mountains and, uh, doing a broadcast from the yeah, forest. That'll be neat. Uh, can't wait till you retire. And you uh, I know I've been looking at it. <laughs> well, brother, this has actually been a pretty long episode. Yeah, it has. We haven't, we haven't done one of those in m- months. Yeah. Good Lord. All right. Well then I guess I'm going to go ahead and call it and say, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. Happy tanking and have a great week.